Okay, we're live, we're back, we're here. It's Friday, it's two o'clock almost. <laughs> and we're here with Mike Anson. And we'll call it Community Matters because the community cares a lot about the Jones Act. And Mike is uh, the executive director of the Shippers Council, the Hawaii Shippers Council. And they care a lot about the Jones Act, so we should care a lot about the Jones Act. Mike, why should we care about the Jones Act here today? Welcome to the show. Thank you, Jay. And it's nice to be back here with you at Think Tech Hawaii. Uh, you should care about the Jones Act because that uh, law uh, restricts the kind of shipping that we can have uh, between Hawaii and the U.S. mainland. And by restricting the kinds and the amount of shipping that we have, uh, that adds to cost and it also eliminates some of the opportunities that we might be able to uh, exercise had the law not been in place. You know, Hawaii has uh, been under the curve a long time because of the uh, cost of shipping. And, uh, and, of course, fuel is expensive and, and will get more expensive because we're using fossil fuel to deliver goods to the islands. Uh, the whole system, you know, uh, calls for higher consumer prices. It's really uh, an obstruction to the economy and the future of the state. No question. But the Jones Act is clearly one factor that makes those expenses go higher because it requires more expensive ships, and the shippers buy expensive ships. They have to amortize the cost of those ships, and we wind up paying for those ships. That's what happens. That's correct. That's uh, correct. The, uh, the Jones Act fleet that exists in the United States is a limited fleet. Uh, it uh, costs five times uh, more to build a large ocean-going ship in the United States than it does in, say, South Korea or Japan, and that puts an artificial creates an artificial shortage of large uh, ocean-going ships of the kind that serve Hawaii, Alaska, Guam, and Puerto Rico. Now, the federal government could come in and incentivize shipbuilding. They could incentivize the construction of shipyards all over the country. They could incentivize cheaper labor in those shipyards. The unions could give us a break, and we could make ships that are cheap, too. However, we don't. Korea makes them much cheaper. And Japan even with much higher, even with a higher wage uh, situation in Japan, they can produce ships at one-fifth the price that we do here in the United States. Uh, the government, at one, up until 1986, the government did have a shipbuilding program known as a construction differential subsidy program, and uh, that was finally eliminated. It was uh, started in 1936, and uh, it was finally eliminated in 1986, uh, because the cost of construction and the subsidies were just becoming so large that it didn't make sense to, to, for the government to continue with this so process. So what's happening instead is places like Hawaii and Puerto Rico, another island state or island territory, we get to, we get to pay the cost of the American, the failing American shipyard industry. One half of the Jones Act fleet is employed in what are known as the non-contiguous trades, that is, uh, Puerto Rico, Alaska, Hawaii, and Guam. So we are, uh, we are saddled with 50% of that big ship cost of the Jones Act. Now that is terrible. I mean, it's terrible. And it's, and it's hurting us more than most other things. And it is something we could change with the stroke of a pen. So why haven't we changed it? Uh, because there are vested interests who support the Jones Act in the way that it is currently um, in the law. Uh, at the Hawaii Shippers Council, in, in the name of Hawaii Shippers, we are talking about the merchant cargo owners, not the ship owners. And the merchant cargo owners, the people who place their goods on board the ships. And they pay the freight. And they pay the freight. Just like we do, everyone. And every consumer ends up paying the freight the, once they purchase goods and merchandise in the stores. Well, this is a huge political force, Mike. I mean, you're talking not only about a lot of shippers. There are more shippers than there are ships, for sure. Sure. That's by definition. And there are a lot more consumers than there are shippers or ships. So right. why don't we have a political force that can walk in the, you know, the front door of the, of, the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the capital of the United States and say something about this? Uh, well, there's a, there's, one, there's a couple of problems. One is that uh, when you look at it from a nationwide point of view, you have very diffuse costs and very concentrated benefits. In other words, the average person who lives in the United States pays a very 
small cost of the Jones Act, but the people who the uh, the ship owners, uh, the shipyards, and the, the unions that are involved in those industries, they get very concentrated benefits from this. So it's hard to motivate. They, they get this freight. Yeah, but they get you know there's there's very high wages. Uh, there's lots of profits. The unions, of Ex course, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, this is the, and this is a, um, a, a, a usual problem in many uh, regulated industries, is that you get diffuse benefits, or diffuse costs and concentrated benefits. It's a classic kind of situation. So the regulators do not see this as an issue where all the people are being injured. They see this as uh, the objects of lobbying by certain interest groups. Right. And uh, for example, the uh, when when they when lawmakers look at this, or when policymakers look at it, they'll look at, gee whiz, we might lose some jobs in a shipyard if we were to allow foreign-built vessels to be imported under the U.S. flag and used in a domestic uh, uh, trade. But what they lose sight of is the fact that because we have such a shortage, an artificial shortage of ships. There's no real shortage of ships in the real world, just in the United States. We do and, be shooting ourselves in the foot. And, and yeah. You know, shooting and, ourselves and, in the ship, if you will. Right. And, uh, you know, who knows how many jobs, opportunity, how many uh, economic opportunities are lost and how many jobs could have been provided in other industries. If we industries, have a free market on this. If you had, yeah, more of a free market. Yeah. Uh, the Hawaii Shippers Council is not proposing to uh, repeal the Jones Act. No, but a good case can be made for that. It's not doing anybody mm -hmm. any good. Yeah, but that's a pretty hard... It's, it's, a, it's a practical yeah. approach. Yeah. Right? And, uh, Am I right? Right. But if you took it on a philosophical approach, you would repeal it. It's a practical approach, as you know those interests are out there. They would oppose, vigorously oppose any, any repeal. So the only practical way to approach this problem and have any chance of success is with, a, with an amendment rather than an appeal, right? Right. What we're and some people have also called for variously in Alaska, Hawaii, Guam, and Puerto Rico for their particular jurisdiction to be exempted from the Jones Act, fully exempted, so that um, uh, the, the, that particular law would not apply to them. That's also... <laughs> <laughs> a very difficult approach to the problem because you're talking about foreign flag ships carrying domestic cargo between two U.S. ports. Our approach to the problem is the main cost driver in the domestic trades is the cost of the ship. It's five times what the worldwide industries are paying for these ships. If we were to allow foreign-built ships to be registered under the U.S. flag and then used domestically, that would increase the supply of ships, increase the competition, and bring down costs. So easy to fix it. It's so very many easy. ways to yeah. fix it. But we have a delegation in Washington that ostensibly represents Hawaii in federal matters in Congress, in the House, in the Senate, and there are four of them. Is there any member of that four-person delegation who supports the amendment, the, the modest amendment of the Jones Act? Not a single one. Can you uh, explain that to me, Mike? Sure. Uh, they enjoy the support of the Jones Act maritime unions. And those unions uh, can put a lot of people on the street to campaign for you to sign wave. This, this is and, a lobbying business. And, and they provide, um, you know, uh, campaign funds, right. and so do the ship owners. So this becomes a situation where, where, it's a, it, where they've got uh, support for their campaigns. There's also the issue of, the, of national security. Many people put forward the fact that the Jones Act is essential for national security. And uh, with a declining Jones Act fleet, that argument becomes harder and harder to make. I don't buy that argument yeah, at all. Yeah, it's not. I mean, it's, I, I've heard it made, but gee whiz. 
this is the 21st century. Let's not live in the 19th, well, the, the early thing, 19th. The thing is that, I mean, when you look at, say, for example, the maritime industry versus the aviation industry, the maritime industry, the ships and the vessels have to be U.S. built. You look at the aviation industry, you can, if you want to run an airline, you can buy uh, uh, a, a plane from Europe Without any comparable well, Jones Act limitations. Exactly. There's no build requirement within the aviation cabotage. And there's the, uh, the Jones Act and the other um, similar kinds of legislation in the United States are generically known as cabotage. Cabotage was first, the, uh, con the concept of cabotage was first developed in the maritime. But during the 20th century, it was extended to aviation, trucking, and railroads. In the other transportation modes, there is no requirement for a U.S. built uh, equipment to transport cargo, whether it's a bus, a taxi, um, an airplane, a rail, a train, or Jones Act ships to carry U.S. cargo among U.S. in another country and import it. And if you look at the aviation industry, the the uh, shipbuilding industry is more abundant in the United States. It's, it's that means it's, it's, dead or dying. Yeah. <laughs> and if it didn't have the Jones Act, it wouldn't exist. Yeah. If but the it, natural market, if in the in the free market, there would be no, because they can't do it. They can't. They, they can't, can't make compete. a buck, and yeah. they should go out of business. But if you look at the aviation, uh, the airplane manufacturing business, we have a the largest exporting uh, com company in the United States is Boeing. Yeah. We supply the world. Yeah. And. We, there's no requirement that a U.S. airline has to purchase an airplane from Boeing. Sure. Yeah, so, so, you know, the security argument doesn't work at all. I mean, it is hard. ...from domestic trade and required to pay fees when arriving at U.S. ports. Which Maritime is more important than the aviation, aviation and space? No way. No way. <laughs> it doesn't work. Well, I mean, it's incredible that this goes on and the public keeps paying these high shipping costs in everything we buy here in this state. Everything has got a, another tax on it is what it amounts sure. to. A substantial tax um, and we don't say anything. And, and that's we, why I really appreciate you coming down here for these discussions, Mike. And it, it doesn't, and that doesn't include the lost opportunities. Uh, you know, when a specialized ship needs to be used that uh, is just not possible to acquire a, a U.S. built basis. Let's talk about progress, though. Okay. Last time you were here, we talked about, uh, in fact, we connected with the, uh, I think she was the, uh, the, the, the president of the Senate of Puerto Rico, was it? Uh, that was uh, Senator Lopez, who is a, a committee chair. Committee chair of the Senate. In, in, a, in a Senate committee, yes. And she spoke. In fact, there was a vote in Puerto Rico. Uh, I guess it, it couldn't control federal legislation. No, but no. They, they, they made a, a statement. Well, there, there's, there's been some interesting developments yeah, on please. that. Uh, those, the hearings were uh, January and February of last year. Mm -hmm. And I was, had the opportunity to testify before a Senate committee in Puerto Rico from this establishment. From this from this table here, as that, I recall, that by was, Skype, you testified to the Senate in the territory of Puerto Rico. Right. And you were good, too, Mike. And that was on January 29th. Uh, as, a res as a result of these extensive hearings that the Puerto Rican Senate held, they are going to be uh, releasing a, uh, a report on April 13th. Timely. Yeah. Well, a little late, actually. But it's okay. over a year. Wrong <laughs> that sounds like Hawaii. <laughs> yeah. And uh, they're going to schedule a televised event, and they're asking for participation from Hawaii, Alaska, and Guam. So we're looking at putting that together, and possibly we could use your facilities sure again. Sure you can. It would be at noon on the 13th. And the report, as I understand it, will call for what we call non-contiguous trade Jones Act reform, meaning that there should be a reform of the Jones Act to benefit Alaska, Guam, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico. Right. Just we're, the non-contiguous areas. Right. And that's a practical approach. Exactly. Uh, we're not non-contiguous as, as compared to what is known as the contiguous United States, the 48 states that are all fitted together in the what's otherwise called the 
the U.S. mainland or from Alaska, the lower 48. <laughs> so that's an interesting development. Uh, we've had uh, four companion resolutions introduced into the Hawaii State Legislature on February 20th of this year. Uh, this is a third consecutive legislative session uh, in which similar resolutions have been uh, introduced. On the Senate side, we had a, a total of nine introducers, which is about... Can, can you give us the names of those individuals, those sure. representatives, those uh, senators? Uh, the Sen on the Senate side, the, uh, the nine are Sam Sloan, Willie uh -huh. Sparrow, uh -huh. uh, Galateria, Breeze Harimoto, uh -huh. um, in Senator Inouye, uh, Senator Keith Arag Agaran, uh -huh. Senator Nishihara, and Revere. So that's a total of nine. That's actually 36% uh, of the Senate signed the resolution. That's pretty good. Yeah. On the House side, we didn't do quite so well. Uh, that was introduced by uh, Representative Kong, who is a Democrat. Uh, uh, Representative Evans, Matsumoto, Tupola, and Ward were signing there. That's only five. That's a, about 10 percent of the uh, of the membership there in the House. So, what, what was the uh, the outcome of all that? Uh, the uh, because there were so few uh, introducers on the House side, we're not expecting uh, a hearing there. But on the Senate side, uh, because there were a number of introducers and and it's got a single uh, committee referral, which is unusual. Usually you get three or four committee referrals. Uh, so a single referral to Judiciary and Labor. And the chairman of that uh, committee, uh, Senator Keith Agaran, uh, is one of the introducers of the resolution. And he has until the end of this month to schedule a hearing. So we are hopeful in that regards. Yeah, knock wood. Okay, this is Mike Hansen, the Hawaii Shippers Council. Uh, we're, we're doing an update on the Jones Act, which we should do from time to time here on Community Matters, because it does. We'll be right back after this break. Aloha. I'm Kili'i Akina, Making president of the Grassroot Institute and host What's of that? Ehana Kako, a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network. Ehana Kako means let's work together. Think of the sad alternative, let's not work together. Here in Hawaii, with all of our diversity and the richness of the people, it's important for us to come together around issues on the, the basis of what's right, and what's good, and what's going to serve the common good. And that's what we try to do at Ehana Kako. Every week we interview movers and shakers, people in government, business, and other sectors of society to talk about how to create together a better government, economy, a better world here in Hawaii that can bless the rest of the world. I thank you for your attention to Think Tech Hawaii, and we look forward to seeing you every Monday, 2 to 3 p.m., on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. We're Ehana Kako, and we wish you well. Aloha. Okay, we're back, we're live, we're here, and I want to mention that we've been playing a video in the background. Uh, it's a video that deals with the Jones Act. We're actually going to upload the, this to YouTube to be sure it's available. And uh, Mike, you can embed it if you like in your site, but anyone else can too. It's public domain. Right. It's about the Jones Act. Uh, so let's, let's uh, continue, Mike, if you would, uh, with the progress that is being made. Uh, so you described uh, the state of affairs, if you would, uh, if you will, if you did, <laughs> here in Hawaii, but then there's also Guam and there's Alaska as non-contiguous areas. Right. We covered Hawaii and Puerto Rico, and next uh, jurisdiction will be Guam. Uh, Guam passed a resolution or adopted a resolution last August endorsing non-contiguous trade Jones Act reform. So there on the legislature of Guam is on record, and that was a 12 to 3 bipartisan vote on the part of the legislature in Guam. So that essentially passed the legislature in Guam as a resolution. Adopted as a resolution, which is, shows overwhelming support for this kind of reform. Yes. Uh, and more recently, in February, um, late February, uh, Governor Eddie Calvo of Guam attended the National Governors Association winter meeting, and there uh, spoke, uh, actually addressed the other governors, uh, ex uh, explaining how badly Guam needs 
Jones Act reform. Now you're in touch with these people. You oh, talk sure, to them, yeah. they talk to you. Of course. Yeah. It sounds like there's a kind of loose organization among the non contiguous areas. That's that exactly talking, what we're trying to develop. Notes. Yes. Good idea. Yeah. Yeah. We're trying to get that going. So there's that's the situation in Guam. Uh, in Alaska, the, the key person there is State Senator John Coghill. He's the majority leader, Republican, because the Senate is the both houses are uh, majority Republican. And uh, I was uh, told today that uh, they will be uh, introducing a Jones Act reform legislation uh, in the Alaska State Senate, and I'm not sure about the House. But so a resolution will be going in, and that would be the first resolution uh, in Alaska uh, concerning the Jones Act for several years. Mm -hmm. You so mean there was one before? Uh, there was there was quite a lot of activity uh, about 20 years ago. Then it died. Yeah. Interesting. So, you know, funny, from the, this little survey, uh, uh, there are more areas you want to talk about, or is that sure. it? No. Uh, from this little survey, it sounds like, am I right, that the Senate, as opposed to the House, seems more interested in these states, um, uh, and also that uh, the Republicans seem more interested. Is that true? Uh, well, in, in Guam, for example, there's only a single chamber. And it's called the Senate. <laughs> okay, so, well, it sounds and, but it sounds like that's the, very and, efficient. Anyway, and the and the and the, uh, and the majority is Democrat. Interesting. Yes. So I get. So I guess when you shake it and bake it, it's really a, a nonpartisan, nonpartisan issue. Yeah. It's a bipartisan. Bipartisan. Issue. Okay. And in Puerto Rico, uh, they actually don't have uh, the national parties present. They have two, basically three local parties. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's split along the lines of who supports statehood and who doesn't. That's a very big issue, I'm sure. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the thing about this is that um, you have four resolutions, I count them right? Yeah. In four separate places, are they the same? Are you helping to coordinate? Are these res resolutions in any detail? Do they tell Congress that they should adopt a statute like this or like that? Or is it just sort of a uh, they're very a, a vague statement. No, no, they're very detailed, and uh, they uh, lay out what are the non-contiguous jurisdictions, why are they uh, disadvantaged by the Jones Act. Uh, we've uh, mentioned the progress that's occurring in some of the different jurisdictions in the resolution, and we've also uh, listed uh, some of the studies that have been done recently regarding the Jones Act and the non-contiguous jurisdictions, mm -hmm. which shows uh, why this would be a good thing to do. Economically, you sure? at the very least, yeah. a lot of dollars involved. So, uh, so I guess it's really simple. It says, here's the reasons. We would like Congress to exempt these, my area, your area, your area, these four areas from, from the effect of the Jones. That's really from, simple. From just the build requirement. Just the build requirement. Right. Right. Simpler yet, a very yeah. modest. Right. Okay, and now have, have you, has anybody presented this to our delegation and say, hey guys, you know there's a lot of support for this, there's a lot of damage if you leave it the way it is, um, there's no real damage if you change it, so what about that? Has anybody gone to them, sat in their offices and made the case? I've spoken to a number of uh, staff people. And That's what uh, you can do, yeah. yeah. And um, they are, they're not very enthusiastic about it. And uh, basically, the word comes back and says that the uh, the representative of the senator is not interested, and oh. in fact supports uh, the Jones Act the way it is. Okay, so I guess that's a political reality, sad political reality. Right. Uh, what we're hoping is that through the process of building support for resolutions calling for this particular reform, that that at over time will sway at least some of the members of our congressional delegation. But and, you know, it, I'm sorry, go ahead. And in addition to that, uh, we've got support for, uh, from the two delegates to Congress, one from Puerto Rico and the other from Guam. Oh, so they buy in. Oh, sure. Uh, they, and uh, in Aloha. Alaska, uh, where we should be able to get support from at least uh, one or two of the members of their delegation. 
It's so so, interesting. so well, once we start getting that sort of a, a accumulation, then hopefully we can bring some of the Hawaii delegation into the fold. Yeah, I want to talk about that. But if you look at these places, um, you know, I, Puerto Rico has a lot of population. I'm not sure it has. It's not a state, for one thing. Right. So that puts it one down on the ladder. Uh, Alaska, you know, is just not that big in the economy. We are the, the well, category Al Alaska's killer. got a lot of economy. I mean, you look at the, the oil and gas. Uh, oh, if subtract oil and gas, or if you look at from a population oh, point sure. of view, yeah, yeah. it's really smaller than Hawaii. Sure. I, my, my, my sense of it is that Hawaii is the most uh, significant jurisdiction of all of the four that we've been uh, talking about. Probably the most influential. But, it, it, what do but, you mean by influential? Uh, in, in political terms. Yeah, well then, why? Yeah, so it would be more important and more effective if our delegation spoke on this issue. Sure, of course. Than any of the others. Yeah. And, and, the, and the, the problem is, I think that our people, uh, our public, our electorate, uh, isn't in tune with this issue. They don't understand. And it has not been made, am I right about this? It has not been made a significant um, you know, election issue, or has it? Has anybody made this a, a mandate issue in a, in a significant statewide uh, campaign? Gene, Gene Ward did uh, in his campaign many years ago uh, against Neil Abercrombie. And um, so did uh, Orson Swindle. Hmm. Orson Swindle That's made a, that. That was a while ago. Yeah, that was back in the 90s. And Orson Swindle, I believe, was mid-90s. Well, you know, the way the system works is if you want to do that, you're going to find that the maritime interests are going to give money to your adversary. Oh, another person who uh, recently did that was Ed Case. Yeah, he and, was courageous. And, and he was, that was, say, in the early uh, 2000s. Mm -hmm. And then more recently, uh, Charles DeJoux. Mm -hmm. Didn't help him that much. Mm -hmm. Well, Charles got fairly close. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, I'm not sure that the uh, Jones Act helped or hurt him, but... Uh, there is some interesting movement on the international front yeah. as far as Jones Act is concerned. Uh, that's with the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, which is uh, a free trade agreement that's being negotiated between the U.S. and the EU, the European Union. And the European side is pushing for uh, uh, exemptions for their ships and, uh, and ship, ships that they might build and ships that they may employ under their flags uh, to uh, trade in the United States. For, for, contigu for stops in contiguous ports in the United States, is that what it is? Well, uh, f there's two different groups. One is called Sea Europe, and they're the trade group that uh, represents uh, the shipbuilders, ship repairers, and the uh, marine equipment manufacturers. And they would like to sell uh, ships built within the European Union into the American domestic market and have these ships... Qualify have, as Jones Act ships. Have coastwise American privileges. American-made ships. Yeah. Well, you know, there's some very big shipyards. Uh, I remember there was a big lawsuit over the... Um, not the Luralene, but the... Monterey. The Monterey, because it, it had a section of steel... Sure. Uh, you know, built into it in, 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 the, fin in the Finnish, uh, Vartsila. Vartsila was a yep. big national shipyard in Finland. Right. And uh, then there was a lawsuit saying that uh, it didn't qualify as a Jones that, Act that, ship. That's what's, that's what's known as the second proviso of the Jones Act. And it restricts the amount of work you can do on a hull outside of the United States. And it, the, essentially the rules, it's a 10% rule. And if you only ten percent, and if you exceed the ten percent, you don't have an American ship anymore. It, well, it can be an American flag ship, but it doesn't have coastwise privileges any longer. In other archaic, words, archaic. <laughs> archaic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so then you're saying and, that this arrangement with Europe, where they would like to be able to work on American ships, they would uh, like but, they, in Europe. There's uh, two different groups. One is the the people who build the ships in Europe uh, and manufacture the equipment. That group, C Europe, uh, S E A Europe, they would like to be able to sell their sh the ships that they build in their shipyards into the U.S. market, domestic market, 
and have those ships used to transport cargo and people within the United States. In other words, those ships would have coastwise privileges. Yeah. And this is part of the TTP, TTIP, yeah. Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. Is it going to stay in the deal or is it going to get uh, negotiated out? And then the other one is the European Community Shipowners Association, and they would like to have the, um, uh, the allowance to do what's known as international relay. So if one foreign flag shipping company drops a container at one port, but the actual cargo needs to get to another port, another foreign flag ship can come along and move that cargo to its final destination. That's what's referred to as international relay. And they're asking, the ship owners are asking the European negotiators to obtain for them that privilege for, uh, for ships that are registered in the EU countries. The US uh, trade negotiator, uh, Michael Froman, uh, has said that uh, the US will not consider any breaches of the Jones Act or the cabotage laws, but the Europeans uh, are pushing a little harder now, so we'll have to see what happens. I'm with them. Sure. You know, the funny thing is that, you know, the waterfront has always been a politically powerful place, always. Mm -hmm. From way back, way back, hundreds of years, it's, it's a, there's a lot of political power in the waterfront. There's a lot of pol political power in the waterfront here in Hawaii in many ways. Sure. State Department of Transportation, the Harbors Division very powerful political organization, mm -hmm. and of course uh, the unions. And uh, it's going to take uh, <coughs> effectively public education like you're doing, and hopefully we're helping you with that. Sure, um, oh, absolutely. And uh, the, the public is going to have to get uh, into this issue. They're going to have to speak on this issue. And when they make enough noise, maybe our delegation uh, will change its position on it. And right now, um, if the public is so inclined, they may contact Senator Keith Agaran at the Hawaii State Senate and ask him to do a hold a hearing on the on this on the this Jones resolution, on yeah. the Jones Act resolutions, and of course you can find him uh, through the internet very easily. And the last item that's been we in only the only have a minute left, so finish fast. The last item that's been in the news recently is the issue of uh, lifting the ban on U.S. crude exports. Uh, many of the big oil companies, the oil majors, want to be able to export crude because you've got a situation of oversupply in the United States in certain areas. Refiners who are relying upon lower cost crude say, no, wait a minute. If you get a, uh, if you're lift, gonna lift the ban on exports, we want to see reform of the Jones Act, so, so we can for that. so we can move oil, crude cargoes and other car, oil cargoes from one port to another without it costing an arm and a leg. You know, funny thing is that as we move into the 21st century, that kind of thing is going to happen more and more. Sure. And maybe your circumstances will change and and force the Jones Act off the table out of control. Uh, Mike Hansen, uh, who is the executive director of the Hawaii Shippers Council, giving us a Jones Act update. We want to hear more. We're, we're going to call you again, and we'd like to get updates on a regular basis, Mike. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jay, for the opportunity to talk to your audience. Aloha.